Hi, everybody. We're going to get started uh, in just a few seconds. Um, while we wait, I uh, will introduce myself. So thank you, everybody, for coming today. Uh, my name is Anna John Ferreri, and I work with the digital learning partners we have at Magic EdTech. I'm very excited uh, to be here today with one of those partners called Education Design Lab. Um, we're going to be covering a very important topic, especially in today's world of digital learning, which is uh, uh, credentials in the higher ed space that translate to the world of work. Um, Naomi's going to cover the topics of today's webinar in more detail, and then uh, I'll be jumping in later on to explain uh, Magic EdTech and our platform called Magic Boxes' uh, role in this space. So I'm going to uh, hand it over to uh, Naomi Boyer. Hi everybody, it's great to see you. I see some friendly names in the in the attendee list, so we're so glad to have you here today. Um, my name is Naomi Boyer, as Ann John said, and I'm with Education Design Lab. And we're gonna be talking about higher education credentials that translate to the world of work today. Um, just a little bit about my background. I came to Education Design Lab about a year ago from the world of higher education administration. Um, I was with a university for nine years and then a local community college for another eight years, mostly working on um, in, uh, innovation, strategy, uh, distance learning, uh, alternative delivery design, such as competency-based education. Um, and I was chief information officer for five years um, within that time frame. So I've done lots of fun things and I get to play in a lot of spaces and I'm really excited with the work that I'm doing with Education Design Lab right now, which is, is focusing on trends in higher education. And I'm gonna tell you more about Education Design Lab in just a bit, but for over today, we're gonna talk about um, what Education Design Lab's approach is to making the learner and learning visible out there in the marketplace. Um, we're going to talk about the use of digital micro-credentials to address the 21st century skills, how we're using technology to deploy those micro-credentials, and the, the way we skill, we, we use it to de develop a skilled workforce that meets the needs of industry and industry demands. And with that, I'm actually going to turn it over. We, we are really excited to have you engage with us today rather than just lecturing at you or talking at you the whole time. So we have some questions and some polls embedded in, in the presentation. We'd love to have you, and I'm going to pass it back to Ann John to do that. But also, we'd want to hear your questions. So feel free to type your questions in, and we'll try to respond to those throughout the presentation. But we've also left time at the end for dialogue for anyone who may have any thoughts that they want to share. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Ann John to, to release those poll questions to you. OK, so uh, I'm going to launch the first uh, question. And uh, we want to get to know uh, what space everybody is uh, here today from. Uh, so do you work in higher education, uh, K-12? Are you in publishing? Uh, would you say categorize it as a business or other? I see some answers coming in. A lot of folks from business. I'm, I'm going to show the results in just a few seconds. Of course, lots in higher ed. OK, it looks like everybody has answered. Thank you. I'm going to share those results. We got. 13% uh, in higher ed, uh, 7 in K-12, 20% in publishing, 40 in business, and then 20 in other. Okay, uh, the second um, question is how would you rate your awareness of digital micro-credentials? Uh, none, uh, some, or are you an expert? Okay, so we have 24 says none, 65 says some, and we have 12% experts. Great. And our third 
question is, is your organization offering digital micro credentials? Yes or no? Response is coming in. I'm going to sh show those results. We have 29 say yes, 71 say no. Fantastic, Ann John. So it seems like we have a wide array of, of folks that are um, that are with us today, and both from the industry, both from the different sectors and industries you represent but also the, through the experiences with digital credentials. And we're gonna be digging into that topic a little bit more, but hopefully everyone will find some nuggets um, as, part of, as part of this presentation. First, just a little bit about Education Design Lab. So we are an education nonprofit organization. We are in our sixth year of existence, and really we dig in and tackle the difficult issues that are facing between um, developing the, the supply chain for, for talent. So it's bridging education to the world of work. Um, we co-design, we do not come in with a solution set. We work alongside our partners to test and build solutions that lead to affordability, relevance, visibility, and portability, all towards the future of work, which is how, while we focus on the learner as part of our design process, moving that learner into the workforce becomes a, a critical outcome that we're looking for. We work with, with tremendous partners and we're so grateful that we do. We have over 60 employers that we've worked with, 125 universities and colleges. And right now we are really focused on building ecosystems. So this includes states and regions, but also it includes the education provider, employers, economic development, um, workforce boards, all working together to try to facilitate, facilitate change for their region. And at the lab, our, our founder, Kathleen Delansky, um, a, about a year and a half ago, um, developed what she called a white paper called the Learner Revolution. And um, really, this document is instrumental. It talks a lot about the pressures that the, that the colleges and universities are experiencing, um, the, the, the financial pressures to, to decrease costs, the student debt issues that, that is being incurred, the lack of job possibility and employer dissatisfaction with the talent that they're receiving are all on the side of the pressures and the stressors of the system. And then at the same time, we need to empower learners. We need to empower the learner earner to then be able to leverage what they know and can do and their skills in that marketplace so that they have access to tangibly move, improve their lives as part of the process. And with this, we believe at the lab that it's a moral imperative that we help develop a learner-driven ecosystem. And in that ecosystem, it serves all. So we have an equity lens that we operate under. And in this, in this equity lens, all learners should be able to capitalize on learning that is bigger than just one organization. So we're traversing we, we hear a lot about how difficult it is to transfer credits and transfer um, information from one organization, from one educational organization to the next, but allowing that learner access to what they know and can do very much like medical records so that they can go in, in, to different places and capitalize on their no knowledge. Um, also unpacking and the degree. Um, degrees are proxies for what someone knows and can do. It doesn't get into the specifics of that information. And so when you start talking about competencies, they're taught to mastery and you know what someone can know and can do, their skills. Um, and we're gonna talk about how, how the data infrastructure can help us get there. Um, awarding credit for that knowledge. So what someone can demonstrate as their skills, they should have credit for, for that. And then here we go, we're gonna make the learner visible so that, that the, those skills become their currency in the marketplace to getting a job and improving their so their exist, their quality of life. So uh, COVID-19, well, while, while all of the things that I just said were true a year and a half ago, COVID, the pandemic has further stimulated and exacerbated the situation um, really globally for, for all. Uh, here in the United States, as many know, and I think this is, is, is 
also true in many other countries, the unemployment rate is skyrocketing. People are shifting out of jobs um, and uh, st uh, stimulants like the fact that we have, auto we have artificial intelligence and automation um, and robotics that are, that are shifting the workforce were just exacerbated by people who then were out of jobs and needing to reskill. So digital micro-credentials can really help as short-term credentials that can help those who are looking to retool. And because they're short, they're, they're, they're achievable and um, they can encourage persistence to the end because it's something very tangible that they have at the end of this, of this learning experience. Um, and they can be stacked for a staged achievement. All sorts of skilling going on right now. And for those that even have jobs, they might be looking at upskilling into new roles. They might be looking to reskill into a different role. And I know that, that uh, the lab has worked with the Federal Reserve in Philadelphia that's talked about uh, um, opportunity occupations. And so that someone whose skill base is here may have skill adjacencies to move into another role, which would be reskilling in a different direction. And now we're hearing a lot from employers who are also outskilling. So as they are furloughing or laying off, providing learning opportunities so that those that are out on that are now out of work have can then learn um, skills to re to re-enter the marketplace in another direction. And this has provided a wonderful um, um, uh, leveraging point for shifting the way we learn. That and, and to support business and industry. So competency-based education is not a new concept, but what is, is new is offering credentials. And so within the last five years, there's been a lot of growth and, and um, advancement of competency-based education, which leads to skills and leads to mastery. And um, so different formats and frameworks of learning then become possible to um, deploy to those who need it the most. At the lab, we've started working in micro pathways and we define that as two or more credentials coupled together in a short term basis that could then, as, as a learner exits one of those micro pathways, it further increases their salary to a higher raised salary and more professional um, opportunities, but then it also can stack up towards a degree so that at every exit point, they're increasing their work opportunity, their work potential. Um, and then there's all of these emerging learn and earn models out there, such as apprenticeships and internships and, and so many, such the largest percentage of our population of, of learners are no longer the traditional student and they're working. And so about 85% are actually um, are that non-traditional learner who have lives, who have work. And so uh, the more we can embrace that learn and earn model allows people to learn across the, their lifetime and continue, continue on. I'm gonna remind everyone to stick your questions in chat if you have any. So micro-credentials um, and, and the role that this plays. About 62% of employers are exploring skills-based hiring. The United States has just moved to a skills-based um, uh, hiring process versus requiring degrees. Um, and I don't think we're anybody sure what this is going to look like. I think it's going to trigger many um, employer shifts as well. Google is already there. Um, IBM has made the shift. Um, there are a number of companies who've said, we're looking for credentials, we're looking for skills. We want to know that someone can do something more than we want to see the degree because again that degree is a proxy it assumes someone knows something but we've heard about how um, dissatisfied employers have been with those individuals that come out with those skills and um, the micro credentials can serve three are three different stakeholders in different ways so for the learner these become affordable portable transparent work relevant learning experiences that they can take with them because when you when you have a digital micro credential or a short term credential, it's bigger than the issuing organization, and it lives in perpetuity outside of that organi that organization. So I don't necessarily have to get a transcript in order to get access to that micro credential. For employers, they're looking for talent that's agile, 
and with skills, and yes, they want the technical skills, but we've heard from many, and we're gonna talk about this more in detail, we've heard from many that the um, 21st century skills are absolutely critical for their employment base. And then for education providers who are also in this digital credential space, it allows them to do rapid short-term credentials that can be a part of degrees or separate from degrees to really respond to their industry need and, and to allow them to, um, to, to be a little bit more flexible than they normally are with their degree, their degree acceptance process. And I will say, you know, IBM has just, they just announced that they've awarded their three millionth badge. So the badges and the certifications and the technical certificates are growing um, very quickly. This has been something that's happened rapidly over the last uh, few years. Um, and what's really exciting is that the latest Gallup poll in 2020 is showing that certifications are creating greater equity in the workplace. And you can see with this chart that there are, um, this is a US based information, but it's the number of folks with, with post-secondary degrees and credentials. And um, you'll see that some of the underrepresented populations are growing in the number of credentials they have versus as you if you were to compare that to degree attainment and the number of degrees. So we're going to be talking a bit about um, the labs, how the lab is responding um, in this environment. And we'll go into the details about what our platform is, but we are aiming to make learning visible. Remember, this is what we see as the moral imperative. How do we make learning visible? And so my next couple slides are going to talk about the steps to making learning visible, what that looks like, how you go about doing it. But visible, making learning visible, VSBL is the, our platform name, stands for Verifiable Stackable Bits of Learning. And um, we have, have used this in order to disseminate and positively impact the market and, and, and learners. So how do we go about making learning visible? Well, first thing you need to do is establish competency frameworks. And you heard me mention competency-based education. But the competency framework is more specific and detailed than a, than a large learning outcome. Uh, most universities, colleges, post-secondary institutions as part of their syllabi or a part of their accreditation process have learning outcomes which are larger statements but they're not necessarily skill-based competencies should be able to be demonstrable measured and and taught to mastery and so um, the lab if you see on the right there that the image that's showing our 21st century skills competency framework we've been focused on the 21st century skills and what you're seeing are two of our badges. One is initiative and collaboration. And within each of each category, there's a competency statement, and then there's four sub competencies that that uh, support that. So you might say, well, how do you how do you see or how do you teach initiative? Well, a lot of the these these 21st century skills are fairly global or um, a little hazy and how you would see it and teach it. But what we, with our four sub competencies, they're much more demonstrable and you can see how someone is, is progressing within it. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit, a little bit more, I'll go that into a little more detail. Um, so competency frameworks is the first element there. The second is the learning process. And because the competency can be stated, we wanna make sure the learning for that individual is able to be intentional and explicit. And that competency framework makes that possible because at the beginning of the experience, the learner can, can reflect on what they know and can do. And then through the learning process, which is the image on the right that you're seeing, we go, the lab's learning philosophy supports best practice, which is to share knowledge, have the learner experience it, and then do a performance-based assessment and continue that cyclical process of learning, practicing, and reflecting throughout. Because when they, by the time that learner gets to the end, we want them to be able to say, "Oh, I, I can, I am, have been badged in, let's say, oral communication, 
And I can show you that I can do listen, I can listen actively. And here's how I know how I can do it. And they, so when you go, when that learner goes into an interview, they're able to very clearly articulate how they can show those skills as they move along. Now, the third part is the data infrastructure. This is the pipes running underneath the entire system to make it all, to make the data possible. The skills need to be, the skills that they've gained through step one and step two need to be portable, transfer, transferable, and accessible to others. And we do this through open linked machine readable data. A lot of gobbledygook, a lot of technical speak, but really what it is, if you think on the web, it's having the data be able to be shared so that I can say, oh, here's my badge and here's how you, you gain access to it. So on the screen below the, the text, you see uh, our the lab's facilitator badge, and that's listed in Badger. And there's information that lives behind that, that's the open link machine readable data. It's metadata that when the credential is promoted or shared via their, their social network, and you see that I have my badges listed on LinkedIn there on the left, that when somebody clicks on that to see what that means, the metadata living in a badge issuing system then can become available and they can learn more about what that credential means. So in that badging system, it then lists the skills that can be, that have been achieved. It, it will list the assessment, perhaps the assessments that have been achieved, information about the issuing organization. And so very quickly, without having to go through a hard portfolio, the potential employer or person of interest is able to see what this person knows and can do. And remember, this is talk to mastery. It's not something that somebody got a C in and you're not sure which of the skills in that particular course they, they were able to complete. And the third piece of this process are the data connections that help facilitate all of this. So there are, are uh, credential um, comp compiling organizations that tell about the organization and the credential in which these, these um, certifications, badges, all, all of even degrees have been earned. So Credential Engine is an example. IMS Global is an uh, IMS Global Case Network is an example, and they list information about the credential themselves. So if someone were to click on one of the lab's badges, oral communication, because I've earned it, and they they've clicked on it from my LinkedIn profile, it would take them to where the badge was issued. We'll say in Badger in this case, and then from there. In additional information about that credential gets shared out. And I'm going to show some more slides on that in, in just a bit. And John, I think we have some more polling questions for our audience. Yes, we do. Okay. So does your organization use competencies uh, for learning or hiring? Yes or no? The response is coming in. Very good. Uh, we have about sixty seven percent say yes, thirty three percent said no. How about, have, uh, have you earned a badge yourself? Yes or no? <laughs> wow. 50-50 split on that one. 50 <laughs> split on that one, yeah. And the third one, this is a true or false question. Open data associated with skills gained and credentials earned is critical to the visible learning ecosystem. Is that true or false? Yay, 
you've been listening. <laughs> we have 89% say yes, uh, true. Only 11 said false. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for playing along and for, and for contributing your, your insights um, into the poll. So now we're going to talk a little bit about why you should care about all of this. Like, why does it matter? Um, and this is a quote from one of our partners in Maine um, from Northern Light Health. Uh, we've, done, we've done some work in, in all of Maine, working with the University of Maine Systems. And um, th this employer, you know, basically, and they're talking about our badges specifically, they're talking about the lab's 21st century skill badges, um, and says that it, it identifies the skills that the students have rather than having to sift through resumes. The digital badge easily identifies and separates them from other potential applicants. And so as, as uh, potential employees apply for jobs or internal employees apply for promotions, and, um, and I think now with the changes that we've incurred as a result of the pandemic, you're gonna see more and more applications coming in. Those employers are going to be looking for what are, what are the characteristics that can rise that can rise these particular um, potential employees to the top. They serve as a signal, an occurrency, sort of a beacon as to how we get that individual into the right jobs and match them into the, the skill, you know, matching the talent with the needs that are in, the employer is having. And um, I, I am also working on some projects um, that are looking at how and this is, this is a trend in the future, how, how applicant tracking systems are going to be able to consume records of, of learners to be able to elevate the, um, these digital credentials. Because right now in many of these applicant tracking systems, it's easy to set a threshold for a degree, but they're not necessarily recognizing the resumes as they come in with the digital credentials. And so there's a lot of work to be done on that portion of the data infrastructure. But, but that's, that's coming in the future. So this is our resilience badge. And um, this one's listed incredibly acclaimed. We work with many badging, badge issuing partners. And uh, you'll notice here, I was talking to you about the metadata and what's available as part of that. You can see that the description of the badge and what it means, the competency is listed there and then, and who it is issued by. This particular one was issued by Education Design Lab, but we work with many partners who actually issue our badges in their environment. The skills of those sub-competencies are noted below. And then at the bottom, you'll see that additional details. So these additional details include more things like assessments, linking out to those credential uh, compilers, like I was noting credential engine, would link out to all of those for that additional information so that whomever you're sharing with and whatever means, so it could be a LinkedIn share, it could be a um, on your email, it could be in a resume, there's lots of ways to think about sharing out the digital credentials electronically. They're able to gain information about this and I'm in charge of the information and the sharing of that information. These are our eight badges. I mentioned the 21st century skills badges or, or digital micro-credentials. Um, we have these eight, intercultural fluency, resilience, initiative, creative problem solving, oral communication, empathy, collaboration, and critical thinking. Um, the lab um, has spent the last four years focused on de developing, prototyping, and piloting um, a set of rubrics, curriculum, assessment, and credentials for these 21st century skills. The, the, these were originally developed in collaboration with 20 colleges and 60 employers. And we also had learners at the table as we did this. But these are the skills we heard from our, from our employer partners that were prominent right now. And the work that we did around this were to take, um, we, were, we spoke first to employers um, because oftentimes when we talk about the gap between education and employers, um, there's a language divide. So education, our education partners may express something in a way that isn't perceived the same way by these employer partners. And we needed to make sure that the, the learner had the language that the employer partner would recognize and value. And so there was a lot of work done to make sure that those perspectives were bridged together as a process of developing our competency framework. And we're th we think, we believe, that these 21st century skills digital credentials 
are are useful in helping to level the playing field for underserved learners. I should also I should also note that um, we we deployed these we've had these in, in um, that are actually being delivered and um, this library is not complete and and it, and it's it's a starting point right this is where we started and we hope to build out this library even more so you heard me mention um, four sub competencies for eight, each of our eight digital credentials and you know i'm sure you're thinking okay that makes 32 sub competencies well it 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 is not. It, it, we have 23 sub competencies, and those 23 sub competencies overlap with each of the digital badges. We call this our, our metro map, and our metro map demonstrates how those overlaps occur. So, for instance, if you look at initiative, you have act as a catalyst, which is one sub competency, lead without title, learn from experience, and then self awareness are the four sub competencies associated with that. But if you look at learn from experience and self-awareness, you see that that circle in the middle is, is getting bigger depending on how many other badges that, that overlaps with. So self-awareness actually overlaps with intercultural fluency, resilience, and initiative. So it's, it's a construct that goes across them. Remember, we're talking about skills. So we're not just creating um, creating information to create information we want it to make sure make to make sure that it's absolutely demonstrable in in practice to support the competencies of which we're trying to make headway with so why do these skills matter um, we know uh, having spoken to many employers and hearing this and this is a global representation that that we're hearing that um, these skills are important. Now, remember, I told you we started this work over four years ago, five years ago, and yet these skills in 2020 that you're seeing on your slide were, were just recently released as the most in demand. So I think the, the, the ones on the left, the five on the left are coming from LinkedIn. MZ recommends certain high demand micro credentials to strengthen the regional economies, particularly around the soft skills or we call the 21st century skills. And you'll notice the overlap in what the top 10 companies are saying that they want and our current skills now. So the 21st century skills are more important now. And I'll say now, meaning we're still mid pandemic. I won't say post pandemic, but even in the future after the pandemic, uh, because we know that learners need to be resilient. We're hearing that resiliency, lifelong learning, being able to retool, initiative have been critical as we've gone through this transformation and the shifting in work. The lab has something called the T profile, which the T-shaped learner is not our concept or a new concept, but the T profile, we've taken our eight, eight uh, digital credentials and put them across the top of the T. These are the foundational. You'll hear these 21st century skills called foundational skills, durable skills, power skills, employability skills, lots of names out there. Many of you still call them the soft skills, but they have tremendous meaning and tremendous value. Across the top, these are the skills that people need over time. They really do not shift. They remain important over time, which is what the previous slide was, was linking to. Down the base of the T are the technical skills that someone needs in a particular job. These shift over time. If you're a programmer, the languages that have been needed to be successful in programming have shifted very quickly over the last 10 years. What you're seeing in front of you is something that Strata um, Institute uh, put forward in 2018, and it represents the same concept. The durable skills are across the top. These are the power skills that people need to have over time, the 21st century skills. Over a hundred years, these skills remain constant. Your, your spikes going down represent those changes in technical skills that we need to be able to advance through over time. So we need to be able to shift in those technical skills quickly. I can't tell you how many organizations I've spoken to that have said to me, you know, we can teach them the technical skills. As long as they know how to learn and they're willing to learn and they have the 21st century skills, 
we many feel like they can they can catch them up to speed on the technical skills. So in order to respond to this and to these market drivers, the lab created you saw our eight credentials, and in 2018 we released a toolkit. Um, we have first mover status. We've been very fortunate. We've had over 1,400 users who have accessed our toolkit. Uh, we utilize these. Uh, the, uh, many have utilized these to put out pilots, 800 institutions. And what I find really fascinating is the types of institutions that are that are in our toolkit and are active in our toolkit. And what this, what the toolkit did for us, and it, I'll say it was a free content available on the web with with files. It's really the basic curriculum that could be compiled by a partner. But we learned a tremendous amount from those who had access to our toolkit. And here's what we learned. One, our partner said, hey, these resources are great, but we don't have the capacity internally to do our own instructional design and compile it into content. And we're not even sure of our strategy. So this deployment is taking us a very long time because we're just trying to figure out where we go next. Okay, so we knew we needed easy and seamless integration options for our partners. The second piece is as people were accessing our toolkit and gaining access to that content and utilizing it in different ways, we lost access to the outcome data. We couldn't tell who was successful, why were they successful, how were they successful, what needed to be shifted. And so we know we need to understand those outcomes and somehow maintain a way to, to um, deploy and disseminate content, but still learn from how that content is being used. And third, as somebody would, would draw down the content to use it in their own environment, we lost access to be able to maintain or update that information. So there was no way for us to seamlessly um, improve the content over time with minimal effort. It, I mean, it, we had individual sorts of, of areas that we needed to, to do these updates in. And so we knew we needed some sort of a solution. And that's how we came across Magic Box, who's my partner today here, who's hosting us today. Uh, so if you remember back at the beginning, we talked about Visible, our platform, VSBL, and um, Visible is hosted on the Magic Box technology. And what this solution allows us to do is to license our content, whether it's free or we are, or, or there's a monetary um, association with it. In different, we can do it in time-based value or user-based value so that we can disseminate it very quickly, the content, but still have access to that content to know how it's being used. There's a library where all the content is maintained. So we've updated in one place and it, it then pushes out into all of the instances of that content that we have, we've compiled. It allows for seamless delivery. So very quickly within, a, I'd say within a week, most of it, most of the difficult part of this process is understanding the institutional strategy. And so as we can, we can seamlessly deploy the curriculum, the assessments, the, 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 um, the infrastructure for delivering the, these credentials um, with, with our, within our partners' institutions. But that leads into the, why we have multiple options for learner access. So we can both deploy content via an LTI, which we'll talk about in a little bit, or into your learning management system, or we can host learners within our system as well. And finally, it allows us access to the data so that we can make strategic decisions. We can look at the analytics. We can, we, we can see the direct outcomes, such as how many users have been in the system, how often they've been in the system, what content is being used. Um, and then we can pull associated reports in order to make sure we're continuously improving and learning from the process. Okay, so we told you a little bit about the toolkit. We have three types of access to our resources. And just so you know, if you're interested in, in checking out more information about, about Visible, um, the website is up there in the right-hand corner. But we have our do-it-yourself toolkit, which is content that is freely available that you would access now. We're moving that off of our website and into the Visible library and we can support the materials through that way. Again, this is, this is content that you would then author your own, your own modules. Then we have two that make it easier just to, to run with the content and put it into whatever delivery model you might be using. So 
the two ways we have are the plug and play, meaning it can be integrated into your learning management system. And we work with most of the major learning management systems and Ann John's gonna tell you a little bit more about that in a second. And we can host learners within the system because even with, well, if you're an employer, you may not have a learning management system. We have many education partners or community partners that also do not have a learning management system or if the institution has a learning management system, they may be working with non-credit learners that don't have access to that system. And so we're able to host them within our system. On the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see an example of what one of our modules looks like. Remember, I told you there's four sub-competencies associated with each of our digital credentials. And you can see module one, module two, module three, and module four, we have a common and consistent navigation across all of the modules in order to facilitate learner consistency and to help that learning process, which we know is important in quality instructional design. On the right side of that image, you see some of the content that you, that you might find in that badge. And again, this one is the resilience badge. This is the student view. So if a student were to log into Visible, and this would be more in the hosted model than the learning man the, the LTI model, because the plug and play model would be in your system. So they would be accessing it in your learning management system. But this is the student view if you were to log into Visible and gain access to the library. We also work with a number of partners to best in class in order to make the learning experience the, the qual a quality learning experience to, uh, available. First, we believe, remember we talked about that reflective, reflection piece being very important and that the learner should be very intentional and explicit about what they're learning. So on the way into the learning process, we work with Chexter to deploy a 360 assessment. The individual rates themselves and sends it out to other, uh, other people who can rate their performance so that they have a sense of their threshold with any of these skills moving into the learning experience. And then we also work with Pretzel as a design partner to, for our community building, our interaction, um, the sharing. We also use this tool for the submission of assignments and assessments. And it, we are working on building the integrations right now between Magic Box and Pretzel. Again, the consistency of the, of the navigation. Here's an example of one of our sub-competency modules. And you can see the learn, practice, contribute, reflect, assess, and reflect. This is a consistent structure in, in each of the modules within a course. And then when each course represents a digital credential, and then on the right there is an example of the content that you might see in the learn section of, of the, the system, of the platform. So in December, we rolled out Visible. It was a, um, we started our pilot and we are very, very thankful for all of our pilot pioneers who, who came along on this ride with us and is still on it. So we rolled out in January of 2020 and uh, guess what happened in March? So we had some partners that needed more time and we've been onboarding new partners and we're really excited. We have, um, a, I think we have like 14 more partners coming on board this fall and we're rolling out with them. But what's really, really um, tremendous is the, the types of institutions that you note on this screen. So we have um, liberal arts colleges, we have Research One universities, we have associations, we have um, uh, historically black, co black colleges and universities, we have systems, we have community and alternative groups. So Unity in Africa is one of those. We work with an organization called Ready for Life, which is associated with Cities for Learning um, and Semester at Sea is on this list as well. So we're really excited to have such a grand variety of partners. Community colleges or in technical colleges are also on this list. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Ann John to go a little bit more into some of the technical details for you of what, what's behind the, the hood of our of Magic Box. Perfect. Yeah, so I'm just going to pull up um, my, my screen here. But uh, while we're uh, changing gears, I have to say, uh, Naomi, it's, it's really great to see uh, this this use case for Magic Box. Um, it's been uh, wonderful working with Education Design Lab. Um, on this journey of, you know, bringing the toolkit uh, into, uh, I would say, 2.0, I guess, of the digital uh, toolkit and into the modules that uh, you covered today. I know we've been working together uh, pretty much since day one uh, for me at Magic 
Uh, I saw here we had about 40% uh, publishers. I too was in publishing for about uh, 13 years. So, um, so we'll switch gears now. So I'm going to briefly cover, I uh, want to leave time for, for questions if we can. So I'm going to cover what our role, um, what Magic EdTech and what Magic Box, uh, what our role is when it comes to uh, enabling content providers. And you know, the content providers could be uh, publishers, um, nonprofit uh, education organizations, associations, um, and how we help them not only to create digital content, uh, deploy it, distribute it, of, of course, and um, how we enable them to be really integrated into the uh, education ecosystem uh, digitally, which can't stress how important that is, especially today, right? So I have to mention something that we're super excited and proud of. Uh, Magic Box is an award-winning uh, platform. So it's a digital content uh, and course distribution platform. Uh, in most cases, we do white label the web portal and the apps that we deliver to uh, the, the content providers, um, like publishers and, and the ed tech companies and those that I had mentioned before. And uh, so we white label all that uh, either at the organization level or we could also do it at the product level like we saw uh, with Visible today. Um, so in June, it was awarded a Gold Learning Impact Award from IMS Global uh, in the student success success and outcomes-based learning support services category. Uh, for that award, we actually showcased how publishers, associations, uh, and schools are leveraging the platform uh, to create and distribute, and then also analyze the engagement of the digital uh, content that they have. So we have built uh, the platform in partnership with all of uh, those types of content providers over the past 30 years. And then we actually launched it in 2014 as an off-the-shelf product. Uh, and today we have about 4 million students and teachers that are accessing the learning materials online and offline across about mm, hundreds of um, white labeled uh, di digital products. So we took uh, the very niche requirements in education uh, and built a highly configurable uh, system. And while it can be a complete end-to-end -end content distribution system, uh, here are some of like the key modules uh, that our uh, typical clients and partners will leverage within, within it. Um, you did see that uh, Education Design Lab is typically, is more or less using it or mainly using it for the course creating and distribution. Uh, but it does have uh, an e-reader uh, built in uh, that it's very, very user friendly. Um, it has highlight highlighting and the typical uh, annotations that you would see in an e-reader. Um, I'll go into some of the other functions that uh, we have and capabilities that we have on the platform uh, via some of the other partners in just a minute. Um, but we also do have uh, rostering capabilities uh, and we can also connect to rostering systems as well. Um, and what it, uh, the offline access, which is really important today, that's enabled by the apps that we develop and we deliver. So we do support uh, Mac, Windows, iOS, and Android um, offline for offline access on any device. Um, the teachers can also create and track the homework assignments. So we have a, a homework uh, solution built into the system as, and for the assessments as well. Uh, there is an assessment engine. Um, and we can cover, uh, you know, we have 11 different uh, question types that you can create standard and adaptive tests with. And uh, also teachers can upload their content onto the system and share that content with classes, groups of students or individual students. Um, and it has been designed with a continuous feedback uh, loops and provides really detailed analytics on the student progress and performance but also from a publisher perspective or a content provider, uh, you can also see very detailed analytics around who's using your content, who's licensing your content, where are they spending the most time? Uh, so it, it gives, and what types of users uh, uh, are accessing and where it are, are they accessing it from? So uh, it also has uh, online instruction and virtual classroom session capabilities. Uh, it's a, easy to use, secure environment, uh, and the entire platform in itself uh, meets all of the learning technology standards and compliances today. So here are um, this, the standards and compliances that we meet off the shelf. 
So for assessments, it is uh, QTI um, compliant. So if you're using a, a third party assessment platform, you can quickly upload um, your questions and, and question banks right into uh, the system using a QTI uh, import. And of course, it's LTI compliant. Um, it does meet the student data privacy and, and accessibility standards, including the COPA, uh, COPA, FERPA, and for those outside the US, the GDPR. And uh, we use um, the, and we comply to the WCAG 2.0 AA standard and section 508 standards. If there's any questions, you can just put them in the chat. Um, so here's where we uh, are showcasing some of the partners that we work with. And we work with these partners for various uh, reasons. Um, we know that integrations are key, that there's a lot of uh, technology that is being used in education today. Um, and so we work uh, with those that are LTI compliant. Um, Naomi had mentioned the LMSs that we integrate with uh, today. It includes Moodle, Blackboard, um, also D2L, Sakai, Canvas, and we can integrate with any other LMS system that is LTI compliant. So um, you, it, if you think about some of the tools, not only for the LMSs, but for the rostering, uh, we do have like Clever, Google Classroom, um, Classlink that we can also integrate with for rostering. Um, and we also, uh, and one, one roster as well. Um, Naomi had mentioned, and actually uh, the collaboration that we've done with Pretzel uh, for the Labs Visible product. Uh, we also have partnerships for content, uh, like the one that we have with, it says upcoming, but it's actually uh, now official, a partnership with OpenStax, so that we can deliver not only the platform, but uh, also content with the platform that the publishers um, or anybody can use. Uh, to roll out to uh, students, teachers, universities mainly. Uh, we have partnerships like for Read Aloud capabilities uh, that we've done by integrations with uh, Read Speaker, so that would enable Read Alouds in um, many, many, many different languages. Uh, the platform itself is actually uh, multilingual. Um, I just wanted to mention that. And uh, we have a, a really interesting partnership with a company called Bongo. Um, those are where who powers our video assessments and assignments. And the feature really enables uh, experiential learning that's tied back to specific content. So like for, for example, it could be like an English language uh, learning student that they can now have the opportunity to practice and the teacher can give a video feedback um, to them as well. Uh, it's also uh, super powerful. It could be used for some of the critical skills that we covered here today. Think about anything with communication, critical thinking. Um, and here are just you know, some of the partners that we have uh, in mind, like, uh, or, or that we have today. Keep in mind that we're constantly um, evolving our partner list and with new uh, features and uh, with new integrations um, and responding to that ever-changing education landscape um, because we wanna make sure that the end users, which are the teachers and the students, and in most cases, uh, or learners in general, um, that they have the latest technology that a platform like Magic Box um, can provide because we want to continue to be making that, uh, helping to make that impact in learning as well. So if you want to see the platform in action, uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, at any time. Uh, I can, we can showcase a few other use cases for it uh, in addition to the course authoring tool. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions here today too, as well. So I'm back folks. Let me figure out how to turn my camera back on. Um, there we go. Thank you very much. And John, um, we had some questions in the, in the question space, which I've been trying to, to respond to as you were, as you were sharing and um happy to take any questions additional questions now that folks might have for us to answer you can see my contact information on this on the screen and um, love to to do follow-up and get into some more specifics if there's if there's something that you'd like to pursue after this webinar okay so we have a, a question in there in the question space that says, who are the end users of the Magic Box platform, Ann John? Yeah, so typically the end user uh, um, would be the students or uh, the teachers. 
um, like if you think about if a, if a publisher is actually using um, Magic Box to you know create a digital library, uh, it's really whoever their end users are. So it could be uh, an association member, it could be a university uh, university teacher. At at the end, it could be a student. Um, so it really depends on what the what the workflow is and who the end user of the of the content provider is. Um, and we do support, uh, there's five different views, we call them, or roles in Magic Box. So uh, in addition to the content provider or the publisher view, we also have um, school or a university system admin, uh, a school district admin view, a school uh, admin view. We also have um, the parent portal, and then of course, teacher and student. So we do have some question, other questions too here. Uh, so uh, from Edson, uh, these skills are more soft skills. Could micro badges be applied to hard skills like calculus, engineering, etc.? Uh, and absolutely. They. Um, so I mean, when you're talking about digital micro credentials, uh, there's there's different types of digital micro credentials, and some of them are achievement focused, which are the 21st century skills that we're doing are achievement focused. Others can mark progress towards something at certain levels, you can get them. But regardless of the content area or dis discipline, you can definitely do digital credentials. You just, I would still say, you wanna get down to the competencies that you want to be mastered as part of that particular um, discipline. And then you cluster that together in the badge. You want to make them um, very achievable though. And in, in other words, we're not talking about a degree. And, and I don't think you really want would want something that takes them three years to complete in order to get that digital credential. You want it to be much more tangible than that. One thing I did want to clarify on as well, so the lab's traditional historic model for deploying our 21st century skills has been working with, and you heard me talk about our pilot pioneer partners, working with partners. So the, the organization, whether it's a community group, an employer, an education institution, um, an alternative education provider, uh, historically has um, been the facilitator. They issue the badges. They take our framework and assume our framework, but the institution issues the badges. So the facilitators actually work for that institution. They use our rubrics. They use our competencies. They can choose to use our content if they, if they want to, but they are still awarding it. This past spring, because of COVID, we rolled out something called hashtag be resilient that the lab actually hired facilitators in order to offer resilience. And we part, we were very uh, fortunate to partner with Magic Box um, in, that, in that, um, that test pilot for us. And we were really pleased to be able to, to issue and, and award badges and resilience because if ever there was a time when we need resilience, it's now. It's now. Yeah. So we got about two minutes. Any of the questions that are in the chat, uh, I know that there's probably more that we have time to get to, but we will address um, all of them and, and send it to those who ask. Um, just uh, Naomi, if we can, so Frank has two questions for you. One, if um, what are some of the future competencies that you'll add to your library? And I believe he had another one is, do you provide assessments to determine to the degree to which an individual has mastered a specific con uh, competency prior to additional training? Yep, so um, the first question, as I said, our library is not, um, it's not conclusive. It is not, it is not an end all. We are looking to add more badges. I, I, you know, I'm speaking for myself. I know the ones we're exploring, but you know, digital literacy is absolutely one of those areas that we think we probably need to build out some more and, and build additional badges. Um, we also um, like, my personal research area is self-directed learning. And so I've been working on building a self-directed learning badge that potentially could be stacked into um, another, like maybe a lifelong learning badge. Um, and that's something I should also note. So at, at the lab, we through some of our challenge projects that we've run, we've actually taken and stacked some of the digital credentials together. So like a three, certain three might be a skill boosters, which we're doing with one of our projects in San Antonio, working with Palo Alto. Um, college system. So we have many of those. And then to the assessment question, 
Um, we have that 360 assessment coming in where someone can self-reflect on their own learning, what they know and they think they can do, but it's also asked of their colleagues, peers, supervisors, so that that information comes into them before they begin the learning experience. And then we have our performance-based assessments with rubrics at the end of the learning experience as well to balance that out all to mastery. Good. So we're just hitting two o'clock here now. Um, if, again, if anybody has any questions, uh, wants some more information uh, about the Visible uh, product platform, um, contact Na Naomi, uh, and I would be happy to set up time with anybody on the call today or anybody that you may think may be interested in learning more about Magic Box um, and who we work with and what other, uh, not only um, platform capabilities, but also content services that we provide. I'd be happy to answer any questions. So we'll make sure that you have our contact information um, after today's call. Thank you, everybody. Absolutely. Looking forward to hearing from you. And if there, if there's if any sort of question, don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks, Naomi. Thanks, Anjan. Bye, everybody.